Welcome in to Outkick the Show. Appreciate all of you hanging out with me. I hope that you are having a fantastic Wednesday. And I know, I know this to be true, there may be a few of you out there that are hungover. Maybe a few of you that had a spectacular Halloween, way too spectacular of a Halloween for a Tuesday, given that we are now sitting on Wednesday. So I want to begin today's Outkick the Show with a very important argument that I have been making for years. Humbly, I think I have the best judgment in America. If King Solomon were alive today, his name would be Clay Travis, and he would be talking to all of you right now with this important idea. The day after Halloween should be a national holiday. I think this would have massive support, Republicans, Democrats, independents. I want the day after Halloween to be a national holiday. And I, these are my two uh, platforms I've been running on for some time. And I also want the Super Bowl moved to the Sunday before President's Day And I want President's Day to become always the Monday after the Super Bowl so that everyone gets a national holiday to celebrate Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, all of the presidential birthdays, and the Super Bowl. Tell me that this wouldn't win everybody. Democrats, Republicans, Independents, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, grandma and the teenage grandson or granddaughter, I'm trying to bring America together. Two new holidays on the Travis ticket. The day after Halloween is a national holiday and the day after uh, the uh, Super Bowl is becomes President's Day, which is a default celebration of America and everybody is happy. Tell me that that isn't something that can bring all Americans together. I begin this show on the day after Halloween with my national call for that. By the way, we had hundreds of people come by the Travis household last night. Record amounts of candy that was given out. The Travis family uh, stimulus via my wife, Laura. Very well done. Uh, So I hope all of you, no matter your age, had a spectacular Christmas, a spectacular uh, Halloween. And now we're on into Mariah Carey season where basically Thanksgiving doesn't exist even though it's in 22 days uh, and everybody is ready uh, for Christmas. All right, let me tell you something. I'm here to make you rich. Tomorrow, Kelly Stewart, a.k.a. Kelly in Vegas and I will do The Fade. That will be our gambling-focused show If you are out there and you love sports gambling, and I know there are a lot of you, and all you care about is bets on college football and bets on the NFL, we'll have a big discussion for you tomorrow, uh, right in advance of uh, Thursday night football kicking off between the Titans and the Steelers. But I have got 17 winners for you for this weekend in college football. This is what I need you to respect the picks I need you to get ready to tap the vein for the blood bank guarantee. Some people out there, they say, Clay, I don't, what's the blood bank guarantee? Blood bank guarantee is you have no money at all. You are desperate to find money and you go and you sell your plasma. You go and you sell your blood. You take that money and you put it down on the bet because it is My blood bank guarantee, and I will get to that momentarily. First, Wake Forest at Duke, the Nerd Bowl. Two fabulous universities. I would be happy for my kids to go to Wake Forest. I would be happy for my kids to go to Duke. And I will help to pay their full tuition dollars because we're not getting any tuition breaks if they get in by hitting the under in this game. Under 45 and a half. The picks go up. They're at outkick.com. You can go check them out. I absolutely love... The defense is dominating here. Duke can't score. Just got whipped by Louisville. Wake Forest, very enigmatic team. Does not have a very good offense. It's going to be a low-scoring, ugly game. Texas A&M at Ole Miss. You're going to notice a theme this week. It's unders. It's unders, baby. They're going to cash, and I'm going to make you all rich. Texas A&M at Ole Miss. Texas A&M defense. When you analyze a game, 
Sometimes you have to consider, it's a lot like the NCAA tournament. Styles make fights. Styles make games too. And styles decide whether the over or the under hits. What's the most dominant aspect of Texas A&M Ole Miss? If you were convinced that the over was going to hit, you would say, oh, it's Ole Miss's offense. They're going to set the pace. They're going to dictate the tempo. You could think that. You're going to be wrong because the answer is it's Texas A&M's defense. Points are going to be at a premium. This is going to be similar to what we saw when Alabama went to Texas A&M, when Tennessee played Texas A&M, and when South Carolina played Texas A&M. Basically similar to almost every game Texas A&M has played in the SEC all year. The under is the play under 53 and a half down in Oxford for what should be a very good game. Nebraska at Michigan State. Credit to Matt Rule, who I believe in this game is going to get Nebraska Bowl eligible for the first time in years. But how is he going to do that? Low scoring. Michigan State's not going to score many. Nebraska's not going to score any. The Big Ten West is an offensive wasteland, and that continues even when they go on the road against the Big Ten East at Sparty Land uh, in East of Lansing, the under 34 and a half hits. Some people out there, you're going to be stunned by this, have accused your boy of being anti-Rutgers. They've said, Clay Travis, you don't like Greg Schiano. You don't respect the State University of New Jersey and the dominance that the Rutgers Scarlet Knights, the Scarlet Knights that they bring to bear every single weekend on the gridiron, nothing could be farther from the truth. The Ohio State Buckeyes, legendary team from Ohio that they are, do not have a very good quarterback and do not have a very good offense outside of Marvin Harrison Jr. 18 and a half points, way too many. I'm on Rutgers and the Scarlet Knights to cover. Arkansas, Florida. This one I went back and forth on. I actually flipped my pick. I wrote it down as I was betting on Arkansas. And then I sat and I looked at that pick for a moment. And I squinted. And I studied. And I contemplated all the Razorback games that I've seen this year and the fact that they just scored three points against Mississippi State at home and fired their offensive coordinator, Dan Enos. And I thought to myself, do I want to take Arkansas on the road with a brand new offensive coordinator against the Florida Gators? And my answer is no, because Florida looked so bad against Georgia that I think they'll come back home and I think they'll win by double digits. I'm on the Gators against the Razorbacks. Notre Dame. Think about how crazy college football is. We have seen Notre Dame, in the space of a couple of years, get a signature win for Marcus Freeman against Clemson and now be in a position where if Notre Dame doesn't win this game on the road against Clemson, Notre Dame fans are going to be upset because they're going to say it's a bad loss for Marcus Freeman. Here's what I like. The Fighting Irish minus two and a half and the under 45 and a half. And I'm going to talk before the show is out today about Dabo's super viral answer uh, to, I think it was Tyler from Spartansburg that our guy Trey Wallace clipped and helped to go viral. Uh, I'm going to talk about that from the Dabo perspective. Uh, But also, King Solomon of the Internet has a life lesson for all of you. Iowa at Northwestern, the under 30 and a half. This is the lowest over-under in a college football game that I can ever remember seeing. It even bounced down to 29 and a half for some period of time. Basically, the Iowa defense is dominating everybody. Nobody's scoring. I'm going to stay on the under. All right. You wanted the blood bank guarantee. Go sell your plasma. Go sit down. Get as much money as you can for your fabulous blood. Tap the veins and put all the money that you make on Oklahoma State plus the points at home against Oklahoma. This line's out of whack. Oklahoma State, six and a half point underdog. I think Oklahoma State wins outright behind Ollie Gordon, who is running for like 900 yards a game. He's the closest thing to Barry Sanders we've seen in a long time come out of Oklahoma State. I am on the Cowboys and Mike Gundy to get this win in what might be the final bedlam for some time because Oklahoma is leaving. Don't like what I've seen from the Sooners the past couple of weeks against Central Florida, narrow win, and then the loss on the road against Kansas. Oklahoma State, tap the veins, boys and girls. Blood bank guarantee win. Could be making a mistake here. 
admittedly. What happened when Kentucky went on the road against Georgia? I'm even wearing my Athens football t-shirt today. Looks good. Fits me well. I look fabulous. I think that Georgia is quite a bit better than Missouri. I thought that Kentucky, when they were 5-0, and would go on the road and be competitive against Georgia. I was wrong. Kentucky got blown out. They've lost three straight. As a result, they've fallen apart. I think Mizzou and Brady Cook and those wide receivers has the ability to put up some points at Georgia. I think that this line, which I got at 15 and a half, but it was all the way out to 17 and a half when it opened. I think Missouri loses by around 10, maybe seven, is competitive against Georgia, doesn't have the horses to win in Athens, but I'm taking Mizzou off a bye week, two weeks to get ready. Remember last year, Mizzou gave uh, Georgia the toughest game in the SEC that, uh, that Georgia had all last year. They almost won, Mizzou did, in Columbia. You can even say Georgia was somewhat fortunate to win that football game. I am on Missouri plus the points. All right, Pitt is off. Pat Narduzzi's team, where they lose? 58-7 to just last week at Notre Dame. I understand why I might be the only person betting Pitt in the entire universe. Florida State hasn't been that good on the road. Uh, particularly not that good on the road in uh, northeastern environments. They were somewhat fortunate to win against Boston College. Pitt has been somewhat okay at home. Remember, they beat Louisville, which is the only loss Louisville's had all year. I'm taking Pitt plus 21.5 coming off the 50-point loss against Florida State. Auburn at Vandy, I'm taking Vandy plus the points. This could be an awful bet. Vandy has been atrocious. Here's the reason. Vandy plus 12.5. Auburn's offense has not been that consistent in the SEC. I think they probably, Auburn, will score 27 or 28 against Vanderbilt. I feel like Vandy can score 17 or more against Auburn. That's why I'm taking the doors. Uh, Cal at Oregon, the over. Cal just lost 50 to 49. They don't have right now a reliable defense. They're moving the ball effectively on the offensive side. I think Oregon's the best team in the Pac-12. I think Oregon will score 40 or more against Cal. I think that Cal will score 20 or more against Oregon, even with public school math, K through 12 in the Nashville public schools. I know that isn't over. Uh, Purdue at Michigan. Everybody's talking about Michigan. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the Michigan scandal here in a moment. I think Michigan is going to blow out Purdue. I've got a minus 32 and a half. Michigan had two weeks to get ready. Uh, I think that they are now going to adopt the us versus the world uh, mindset. And they want to obliterate opponents so they can say, surely they're not doing any checking of signals or anything else now that this was nothing other than Michigan dominance, which was going on. So I am taking uh, Michigan to win this game big. LSU-Bama. I wanted, let me check and see what the latest number on this is. I was inclined to take LSU when this game opened, and LSU was a five and a half point underdog. Then money poured in on, uh, on LSU, And the number has gone all the way down to three. Let me see what the latest number is uh, on this one. Because, look, I think LSU is going to score some points. The number is stuck right around three. And to me, if you're taking LSU plus three, what you're really betting on is that LSU is going to win this game. Now, if you get plus three and a half, if you got them four and five, I think there's some play in the joints there. Plus three to me is almost like, hey, I think LSU is going to win this football game. Not willing to go there, but I do think the LSU offense is going to move the football pretty well. Uh, And I think they won't be able to stop Alabama, which is why I'm on the over 59 and a half. I think that's the better way to play this game is to hop on the over train and ride it. I think both teams will score. Kentucky, Mississippi State, I'm on the under 45 and a half. It's a huge game. Not a lot of people are going to be paying attention. But for Mississippi State and Kentucky both, the winner of this game, and Kentucky, I believe, is a small favorite on the road, the winner of this game will feel like, hey, we can get to six, seven, maybe even on the outside. 
eight wins, right, uh, for Kentucky anyway. Loser is like, man, we're going to really have to scramble to see whether or not we can get bowl eligible. I think it's going to be low scoring. I think there's not going to be a lot of offensive ingenuity. Uh, I'm on the under 45 and a half. Same thing, Miami, NC State, big game for both teams. I am on the under 45 and a half in that one as well. There you have it, boys and girls. 17 college football winners for all of you. Go get your bets in. Thank an early gift from Santa Clay. Speaking of gifts, I want to tell you about my friends at Tunnel to Towers. So I played in the Liberty National Golf Tournament. Some of you may remember this a couple of uh, weeks ago. Uh, I went up there. I helped to raise money for Tunnel to Towers. And at the dinner after the golf event, there were three different widows who stood up and talked about their husbands dying, the fact that they had young children, and what Tunnel to Towers did to help ensure that all of these widows could take care of their kids by paying off the mortgages on the homes they lived in. You know, Frank Siller's a friend of mine. His brother died on 9-11. One of the um, firemen who was rushing to try to go help save lives at the Twin Towers. And Frank said he wanted to ensure that wives and husbands of first responders, of, uh, of, of military veterans, of everybody out there who gave their lives trying to help others, that they were able, their families, to live without having to worry about their homes. He's paid off thousands and thousands of mortgages. He's helping veterans everywhere. I have donated to this cause. I'm asking you to join me. T2T.org. Think about it. The letter T, 2T.org. They're asking for just $11 a month. I'm a donor. I hope that you will consider being a donor as well. These people do phenomenal work, and they are taking care of so many people in America who help to take care of yours and mine's family and help to fight to preserve American exceptionalism everywhere. Please listen to me. $11 a month, it isn't a great deal out of your pocket, but it can make a tremendous uh, difference for so many veterans and so many first responders and their families out there. The website, one more time, t2t.org. A couple of different stories that are out there. I want to take a moment to talk to you guys about Dabo. Uh, Dabo Sweeney has had a a clip go viral where he responds, I think it was Tyler from Spartanburg, to a caller who questions why he's making as much money as he is and is upset about uh, the direction of the Clemson program as they sit at four and four. And um, I spent a lot of time, I listened to Dabo's answer, and I don't know Dabo personally, but I spent a decent amount of time thinking about why is everybody so angry? Why is there this great wellspring of anger in America that exists in sports as well? And I think it's because very often there are two things at play. One is the internet. And I'm going to talk about the internet and why I think it's been destructive to a large degree of so much mental health. And two, uh, the lack of ability to understand uh, sort of the history and trajectory of things as opposed to the immediate issues at hand. And that might sound confusing, but let me, let me talk about it, and I'll take it in reverse order. Uh, most I've had a lot of conversations about this, and I think it's instructive for you, whatever you do for a living as well. Many people define success or failure not based on where you start and where you finish, but they arbitrarily pick a location in your life and say, oh, you're a failure since this job to this point. And Dabo's an interesting point because Dabo has been wildly successful at Clemson up until this point where he's 4-4, four and four, 
And this caller called in and he said, well, you're failing this year and therefore you're a failure. And I think you have to be very careful not to allow that mindset to govern the way that you make life choices. I'll give you an example um, in, uh, in my own life. So I'm signed on for multi-years extension. I'm going to keep doing Clay and Buck on into uh, years and years to come, right? But when I joined Buck and we took that job, a lot of people said, oh, man, it's a massive amount of pressure. You're following the legendary Rush Limbaugh. What if you fail? I think that's the wrong way to think about things. Okay. Um, the way to think about things is I got an incredible opportunity and if it doesn't work out, so be it. But think about all the things that had to go right for you to get that opportunity in the first place. One of the first people I had this conversation with, you can go back and listen to it, is, was Derek Dooley. After Derek Dooley got fired at Tennessee, he said for the first time he had to deal with a form of failure in his professional life. He said, yeah. But if you think about Derek Dooley's career from the point where he decided at 25 or 26 years old, hey, I don't want to be a practicing attorney to the point where he becomes the University of Tennessee head football coach, it's a tremendous amount of success. Now, he didn't win as much at the University of Tennessee as he hoped that he would. But if you look at the life trajectory from... Uh, the point where he decides, hey, I don't want to be a lawyer to becoming the University of Tennessee head coach, even to this day, he's had a tremendously successful life. And what Dabo was pointing out was judging somebody based on how something near the end of a tenure might go, as opposed to judging Dabo Sweeney as, hey, I'm the first guy to ever graduate from college. I had to walk on at Alabama. I had to fight my way all the way to becoming the head coach of Clemson. We have very short-sighted vision of what constitutes success and failure in this country. And I've thought about it a lot in the context of even how, you know, we talk about who does and who does not, for instance, succeed at becoming a great quarterback in the NFL. I'm just using that as an example. You know how hard it is to get drafted and become a starting quarterback in the NFL? Do you know how many successes you have to have and how many hours of incredible amount of success you have to put together to even be in a position to ever start an NFL game. If you define someone as a success or failure based on how exclusively their professional football career goes, most people are going to be failures because most people aren't multi-year starters. Most people aren't Hall of Famers. Most people aren't one of the 10 or 12 greatest at what they do. But if you define as I believe you should, success in life by where you start and where you finish as opposed to just looking at a couple of years of your career. It's a much different concept of looking at life. And I think that's important for everybody out there, whether you sell cars for a living or teach kids for a living. um, Most people who have any measure of success have had to put in a lot of work to be able to get there. And the reason why I tie it in with my radio show is people said, oh, you know, What if you don't succeed? Well, then I'll do something else, you know? If you aren't constantly reaching and taking risks to be something more than what you are right now, then I don't know what you're hoping to accomplish because the fear of failure is far more significant for most people than failure itself. I'll fail all the time. At some point, I'll try something new and it'll fail. It's not going to be the Clay and Buck show. It's not going to be OutKick. But if I had just sat back and remained an employee for my whole life, I would probably be practicing law somewhere. I wouldn't be a hundred millionaire, I don't think. There's not very many hundred millionaire lawyers. And I'd be much less happy. So I thought about that as I watched uh, Dabo's answer. The other thing is, Be careful about the amount of time you spend on the internet. Comparison is the thief of joy. Almost the entirety of the internet, particularly in a social media era, is comparison. That is, oh, does somebody else have a better car to me? Does somebody else look better in that dress than me? Does somebody else... Look, 30% of teenage girls have thought about killing themselves in the past year. 30%. Why is that? I think it's because they're on social media. 
and they're constantly dealing with people, especially when you're a teenage kid, but a girl in particular, you're constantly being judged by uh, judging yourself through the eyes of other people who you presume are perfect, even though social media is fundamentally artificial because most people only put up the best filtered version of their life, not the real thing. And I thought about this in the world of sports, particularly as it pertains to Clemson standing. Dabo Sweeney has taken Clemson football to a level that they have never hoped to uh, rise to ever. Two national championships, uh, consistent playoff berths, If you had told the average Clemson fan in 2000 what was going to happen over the next generation, most of them would not have believed it. Because Dabo took a borderline top 20-ish program and turned them into one of the two best programs in college football. But it's hard to sustain excellence forever. And so Clemson fans now are frustrated because they look around and Florida State's winning now. And South Carolina beat them last year. And they're saying, man, we're not as good as we were in the past. Of course you aren't. But historically, you're still on an unprecedented level. So my thesis is the internet has made every fan just about angrier. Because it used to be, and I was thinking about this, when I was a kid, it used to be that uh, for the most part, you got to follow your favorite local teams. Like, I would read the newspaper, the Tennessean in Nashville, Tennessee, where I grew up, and they mostly covered Tennessee and Vanderbilt. Now, they might cover other teams, but usually just in the context of the way that they were playing your team. Everybody had their own little island. And in your real life, if you go out and you have a friend and they are a Georgia Bulldog fan, or they are an Alabama fan, or they are a Florida fan, and you're a Tennessee fan, you probably like them, even though they root for a different team. On the internet, you don't. Because the internet is, in many ways, a place that steals joy. Because you're constantly coming into contact with other fan bases in a way that you weren't 20 or 30 years ago. Much of that is online, and you don't tend to like people online like you like people face-to-face. And that, to me, was the underlying foundation of, to me, what Dabo was discussing, which is, how do you define success? And also, how, uh, as fan bases, your joy is stolen and your perspective is also sometimes broken. Just something interesting to think about. All right, a couple of other things. Um, Raiders have fired their coach, uh, Josh McDaniel. They're now putting in a brand-new quarterback. Everything is being changed in Oakland uh, slash Vegas. They're going to be Oakland for a long time for me. I know for a lot of you old heads out there, uh, they're still L.A. Uh, The Raiders still have probably the biggest fan base almost in L.A., even though there's two L.A. teams there. A lot of the younger Uh, a lot of the older guys in their 40s and up uh, grew up rooting for the Raiders when they were in L.A. Uh, I think Jim Harbaugh makes a lot of sense as the next Vegas Raiders coach. I really do. And I'm going to talk about the Michigan scandal and the Spygate and everything else associated with that. Uh, But to me, uh, Jim Harbaugh would win at a high level. He's already done it with the 49ers. Basically, the Raiders fan base, much of them still from the Bay Area as well, I think would welcome Jim Harbaugh. He would solve, I think, a lot of the quarterback uh, issues. Jimmy Garoppolo does not seem to be the answer. The Raiders have been a messy franchise for a long time. Really, they've never hit their stride, I would say, uh, like you thought that they might um, in uh, the Gruden era. There's always been scandal. There's been a lot of off-the-field issues with their players. I think, I'm just tossing this out there, Jim Harbaugh to Oakland slash Vegas, and sooner or later I'm going to get the fact that they're in Vegas right every time. I think he would solve a lot of issues. Now, let's talk about this thing that's going on in Michigan. I laid out why I didn't think Michigan, the Big Ten, or the NCAA was going to be able to take action against Michigan during the course of the season, and I maintain that. 
I also told you that I'm betting on Michigan to win big uh, in their game uh, against Purdue. And I think Michigan's going to go 12-0. and um, Because I think they're going to follow the 2010 Auburn. I think I said 2011 Auburn in the last couple of days. Auburn won the title in 2011 in the Fiesta Bowl, uh, out playing against Oregon. I was at that game. So in my mind, I'm kind of imprinting uh, 2011. That's also the year that I started OutKick uh, as the, uh, as the storyline there. 2010 Auburn team, which won the title, as always happens in college football and the NFL, in a different calendar year than the one in which they played for the most part. Um, I think that Michigan's going to go 12-0. and And that this, even with the latest crazy story, which is fun and it's, it's absurd, and I've seen all the memes of this guy on the sideline for Central Michigan, it seems quite clear that Michigan was engaged in a borderline uh, legal uh, process by which they were pursuing all these different sign stealings. I also think it's quite clear that Michigan, the Big Ten, and the NCAA are going to be unable to take action against Jim Harbaugh or Michigan. And I think they're going to follow the 2010 Auburn uh, uh, model. I think they are going to avoid uh, any kind of significant penalty. They're going to beat uh, Purdue. They're then going to go on the road and beat Penn State. And then all of this attention is going to continue to focus on them. And I think Jim Harbaugh is going to be able to use it as evidence of how everybody else is allied against them and how ultimately uh, they believe that, uh, that all of this is going uh, to fade uh, behind the winds, just like with Auburn. And it's going to be hard to prove anything. It's going to take years. And I don't believe there's going to be any major consequences. Uh, okay. I wanted to hit this. There's a Supreme Court case right now that's being decided, and I think it's fascinating. And basically the question is, how do you decide the legality of public officials blocking individuals from from, uh, being able to see their public comments? For instance, every now and then Donald Trump back in the day would block somebody from his Twitter account or his Twitter feed. I've been making this argument, and this has to do, I think, with Facebook accounts, and, uh, and it's going to be in front of the Supreme Court, and you're dealing with a lot of Supreme Court justices that probably, given their age, are not that active on social media and not that familiar with the processes. So I think this is a, uh, this is a fascinating case. Here is, again, humbly, my solution to this issue. And I would say this for Elon Musk. I would say this for everybody out there. I think that even public officials should be able to block people that they don't want to be commenting in their threads. But I don't think you should be able to block someone from being able to see what your opinions are. There are people who have blocked me on social media, Jamel Hill for instance, And I'll get sent tweets of what Jamel Hill said, and I can't see it from my account. I don't have burner accounts. So the only account I have is at Clay Travis. And so I have to be like, dude, I I can't see what she wrote. You know, write whatever you want at OutKick, but I'm not going to react to it. I understand if Jamel doesn't want me able to comment directly on her opinions because she doesn't want me or my audience to be able uh, to use her audience to make arguments. And the analogy I would make is, I'm fine if you want to protest anything that I say. You can show up anywhere that I'm going to be in a public forum, and you can argue against anything that I said. You should be able to quote tweet anything that I say and add on your own position. But I don't think you should be guaranteed the ability to comment inside of my comment thread. So what I would suggest is a reasonable uh, way to handle this from a tech perspective is you can't block anyone from being able to see what you post, but you should be able to block someone from coming into your feed 
and trying to speak to your audience if you don't want them to be able to do so. Let me give you an example. I said you can go show up and react to anything that I say. I'm speaking and you want to stand outside as long as you're following the rules. You should be able to do that. But I don't think you should be able to show up at my speech and yell and try to stop me from being able to make my arguments. And I don't think you should be able to show up in my front yard and protest what I'm saying. And so I think there is a property argument in the context of social media. And I would argue that Elon Musk is even acknowledging it in some sense because I and many others who have signed up for the platform am now getting paid based on what people say in the comments section of my opinions because there are ads that appear there. What Elon Musk is basically saying is the comments underneath your content is property that you, as the individual who is creating the conversation, should be able to monetize. I agree. But I think also simultaneously, you should be able to not allow people to jump into your comment thread if you see them and they're just antagonizing and they're making the conversation work. In other words, worse in other words, much like moderation on the internet works. You can react to anything I say. You can react to anything that I write, but do it for your audience. You don't have the right to come in and speak to my audience, just like you don't have the right to show up at a speaking event I'm engaged in and shout me down, or to show up on the front uh, porch of my house and protest about what I'm saying inside of my house. That, to me, is the right method uh, to solve this case for the Supreme Court, because I think it acknowledges the importance of the marketplace of ideas and everybody having full exposure to all of them. But it simultaneously says, but you don't have the right to come into underneath the comments and react to it. And by the way, that's also the entire concept of somebody turning comments off. I don't do that. And I don't know what the total number of Twitter followers I have is now. I think it's like, you know, over a million, I know. Um, But the number of people I've blocked are a pinprick. Everybody that I've blocked is either obsessively tweeting me, like whatever, you can have any opinion you want, I don't want you obsessively tweeting me, or they're getting in the mentions and constantly trying to share, like, you know, sell something or argue with people. And I don't even check the mentions very often, but every now and then I go in and I'll be like, yeah, like you've responded 20 times and you're just trying to fight people. Boom, you're out. So, That would be my solution for the Supreme Court. Uh, Finally, there's a new Quinnipiac poll that's out. uh, And this national poll uh, sort of reflects what I see as potentially an issue. That is, third-party candidates are going to have a major impact on this 2024 election, I believe. Uh, National poll from Quinnipiac, uh, Biden up 1.47.46. Okay, yeah, basically Trump-Biden are dead even. Uh, But when you add in RFK Jr., RFK Jr. goes all the way up to 22% support. Wow. And Biden actually enlarges his lead from 47-46 in the Quinnipiac poll to 39-36 to with 22% going to RFK Jr. This t- ties in with what the polling that I have shared on my account shows, uh, which is it seems to me that RFK Jr. is gaining a lot of uh, support, and it's coming more from Trump than it is from Biden. Uh, When you add in Carnell West, by the way, uh, you go to Biden, Trump, RFK Jr. at 19%, West at 6 which suggests that RFK Jr. loses some of that support, Biden loses some more, and he still has a one-point lead. I would bet right now that we're going to have four candidates at least on most ballots and that Trump is going to win a close election. Now, we're almost a year out. I reserve the the right to adjust as is necessary, but I would bet right now that Trump is going to win a close election. I also saw this. uh, Interactive polls. Uh, This is who is actually supporting uh, these different candidates, and I'm looking right now at... um, at, let's see, Interactive Polls, I think is who put this out. Um, And 
There are uh, more details coming out. Well, I'll talk about this tomorrow because I do think it's interesting. Um, But the data reflects that the only people who have a positive view of uh, Joe Biden, he has a 39% overall approval rating. Uh, White voters do not support Joe Biden. Hispanic voters do not support Joe Biden. Independent voters do not support Joe Biden. White college graduates and black voters are the only people in America who have a positive opinion of Joe Biden. I thought that was interesting as well. Uh, All right. I appreciate all of you. DBAP, unless you need to SBAP. I am Clay Travis. This has been OutKick, the show.